Good evening. Um, great to be here. We, today we talk about the future, about utopia. I think we live in a very special world where there's maybe not a lack of money or technology, but a lack of curiosity how we want the future to look like. I think that's really interesting. In the 60s, in the 70s, architecture was very curious. Eh? We had walking cities, Archigram, Super Studio, we would go to the moon. And it seems today we are a bit scared of the future. The robots will take over our jobs. So today I would love to trigger that curiosity towards the future and see how we create a world where design improves the world around us. So I'm saying we, because as an architect, as an artist, as a designer, you're always part of a network. So this is the studio in Rotterdam where the team of designers, engineers, project managers are working, the dream factory, where we create, where we prototype, where we put some smart people in a room and try to figure things out. And a lot of it is actually very hands-on, you know, trying, failing, learning, upgrading, step by step, trying to upgrade. And I love technology. Yeah, being the son of a math teacher, I think technology is such a great tool to make your own dreams come true. We publish books. That's really interesting to really show the, the in-depth story. But what really drives us, what really drives me, is this. World Economic Forum eh, that you see here, which is one of the think tanks in the world, based in Geneva, did a research about what are the top 10 skills you and I need to become successful. So I'm giving you the shortcut here. <laughs> and this is very interesting. So it's not about money eh, or technology. But look at this, number three, creativity. Number two, critical thinking. Number one, problem solving, complex problem solving. All the things a robot or a computer is really bad at. Yes, and this is very interesting. So yes, technology takes over a lot of jobs, eh? like taxi driver or garbage collector or accountant. But does that mean that we, in the future, will become robot food? No. It means that our human skills, eh, our desire to learn, our desire to share, our desire to explore, these are the human skills computers are really bad at. And that's why I believe, as you see at this, that, that we will live in a world where creativity is our true capital, because it separates us from the machine, it separates us from the robots, and it's something they cannot really do very well. It's something they cannot copy, yes? Or we become robot food George Orwell. But that's plan B. I want to talk about this new world. Yeah, a lot of challenges we are facing today, global challenges, rising sea level, air pollution, CO2, etc., is for me a sign of bad design. Yes, we have created it as human beings. It's not mother nature, it's us human beings. So we can do two things when we think about the future. We can be sad, cry, hide in a room and blame somebody else, eh, or wait. Or we can say, well, we have created this situation, let's design, let's engineer a way out of it. And that's the scenario I want to talk about today, the last one, where clean air, clean water, clean energy, clean space, eh, the space to think, but also outer space, are our future values, are the core of everything in the future we design, we create, we imagine. So I'll show you some examples of that. Clean water. We know it's very important. At the same time, sea level is rising. And it still seems very abstract. We all know, but it's a bit abstract. So I'm from the Netherlands, from Holland. And we live below sea level, most of it. Yes, we live next to the sea, below sea level. But because of this ingenious system of dikes, windmills, pumps, we somehow survive. <laughs> But my Chinese friends, when they see my country, they are like, are you crazy? Eh? That's very dangerous. Get out of there, eh? move to higher ground. But we don't, and we stay. And we use design, we use technology to create our own home. But sometimes, even the Dutch, they forget that. And that's why we created Waterlicht, what you see here. A combination of LEDs and lenses which show how high water level would be eh, in the future. If we stop, if we don't invest in new ideas, if we take life for granted, and we started to flood public spaces all around the world.
best wel spooky. <laughs> Spacey. Ja. Wat ik, het gevoel dat ik erbij krijg is een beetje onder water. Dat je onder een, een, een laag zit. Ja, best wel mooi, vind ik. With the waves above us. And it's, it's magnificent. Ik weet natuurlijk dat we beneden zeeniveau zitten, maar ja, zoals je het zegt, zou dat uh, niet zo fijn zijn als ik dit opeens over me heen ga voelen, nee. Sixty thousand people showed up on one night. This is in Amsterdam. And it's very interesting because some people were a bit scared, like, <laughs> is that our future world? But most of the people were more inspired. Should we make floating cities or can we generate energy from the changing in tide? So I think it's so important to create experiences where people are not scared of the future, but are curious and, and, and create a place of wonder. Um, this piece is traveling next month in Australia and in New York. Uh, and we're working actually very hard to bring this uh, work to uh, Moscow as well next year. Clean air, as important. Our cities have become machines that are killing us. There's no simpler way of saying it. If you live in a high density city like Moscow, because of the pollution, it is the same as 17 cigarettes per day that you passively inhale. Yes, without the pleasure of the nicotine. <laughs> Not good, bad deal. And so one day, working and living in China, I woke up and I looked outside my window and I see this. Lift is a good day, right is a bad day. Yeah? Pollution. So polluted, I couldn't literally even see the other side of the city. So that day, looking and seeing the difference, I became inspired by Beijing smog. Yeah? It happened. And unfortunately, I'm not a minister. I cannot say 20 billion US dollar in green energy. It's not something I can do. I can design, I can engineer. So being inspired about it and thinking about it, I remember two days later when I was under the shower, being this boy, when I was playing with a plastic balloon at these boring children parties, I would polish it with my hands and it would become static. Yes, static electrified. It would like wank, play with your hair. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. What if we would use that principle to build the largest smog vacuum cleaner in the world, which sucks up polluted air, cleans it, and releases it. This is how we started. Unhindered by any kind of knowledge. <laughs> we were amateurs, trying to become experts. And one year later, we built the first one. So it sucks up 30,000 cubic meter per hour, cleans it on the nano level, and then releases air, so we have parks which are 20 to 70% more clean than the rest of the city. So if the city has become a machine that is killing us, let's build machines that can heal us, yes? It's very interesting. And we designed that it sort of looks like a, like a spaceship. I don't know why, we just liked it. The Chinese started to call us how much? How much? <laughs> and we became part of, of their war on smog. Eh? And it's very interesting. On one hand, the architect is present long term. Eh? Green energy, electrical cars, more trees, more bicycles. Very important. But it takes very long, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. So I think it's also important to do things today. You know, don't wait for permission. And sort of bottom up, start to tickle this new world. And by creating these kind of clean air parks, people can smell the difference, they can feel the difference, they can share the difference. You show the new reality. In a way, you show the, the true utopia. And it was really beautiful to make these clean parks in Mexico, in India, in China, in the Netherlands, or here in Poland. What is interesting when you do these kind of projects you always learn as well. Things happen that you can never imagine. You see these little dogs here on the photo? This is in Krakow in Poland, one of the most polluted cities in Europe. You see these dogs on the right? They look really happy, eh? <laughs> it's very interesting. So the day of the opening, I arrive, and 
I ask my project manager, which you see here on the left, like, how is it going? Eh? Everything is ready. Yes, we've done the scientific research, uh, press uh, interviews tonight, everything ready. So I come at the site, eh? beautiful snow, and I see tens of these little dogs hanging out around the tower. And there are a lot of them, you know? It looks like this secret meeting I wasn't invited for, like this weird David Lynch movie I walk into. So I ask my project managers, what are these dogs doing there? He's like, well, I don't know. So I said, okay, we have three hours. Let's find out. And that's what we did. And of course, after a while, we realized dogs have a very high sense of smell. Yes, they can smell 20 or 200 times better than us human beings. So they were suffering from the smog way more than us humans. And somehow they could smell the clean air from far, far away in the city. And they would start to abandon their owner and hang out around the tower. And you see, they look really happy. Eh? This one is very happy. This one tries to be happy, but it's too small. Eh? <laughs> so if nature, if animals can sense what is good for them, why can humans not? It's interesting. And also we learn this is Beijing smog. This is the stuff we were sucking up from the polluted urban skies. And we had buckets of this stuff standing in our studio. And on the Monday morning, 8 a.m., we looked at it and we realized, shit, you know, we should do something with this. Waste should not exist. Eh? Waste is, is ingredient. Think like a network. Think like a circle, like nature. So we started to look at this incredibly disgusting stuff. Eh? This is like kiss of death, horror. And under a microscope, we saw 42, 48% is carbon. And of course, we all know that carbon under high pressure, you get... Guys, I'm not being rhetorical here. Thank you. Diamonds, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Yes, so inspired by that, we compressed it for 30 minutes. And so by sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meter of clean air. And this was very interesting. Oh, yeah, here, I have one. Don't worry, I'm not gonna propose, but you can show it around. <laughs> Don't worry, <laughs> you can show it around. This is uh, Rotterdam smog. I also have Beijing smog, Prague smog, Krakow smog. And this was very interesting because suddenly it was not about machines or technology or science, which is very important, but only technology makes us lazy, yeah, makes us a bit stupid. We rely on it, we don't change. And by sort of making it shareable, by making it tangible, it became personal, yes? And we launched a Kickstarter, a crowdfunding campaign. So the finance we make with the smog free rings helped to build more towers. So the waste wasn't the waste, it was the activator, it was the enabler. But besides the money, yeah, because as I said in the beginning, there's not a lack of money in this world, but a lack of imagination, community started to wake up. This is a real photo of a real wedding couple, New York Times validated this, not actor, where he proposes to her with the smog-free ring as a sign of beauty, yeah, as a sign of, of hope. And so they sent this photo to us, and we're like, oh, that's really cool. We never expected this would happen. <laughs> so we called them to, to check, and um, she said yes yeah, to him. And it's really cool, because sometimes I call with them to check if they're still okay, you know? And they're doing okay, they're still married. Yeah? Somehow I feel responsible for this marriage. <laughs> of course I am not. But, but I think, you know, these kind of things make it real. You need science, you need te technology, but you also need people. You ne need to make it personal. These topics, air pollution, are so big. So you need to make it really, really small. This project, as I said, is launched around the world. We're opening a whole new smoke-free project in Korea in the coming two or three weeks. Clean energy, also one of my favorite. We have water, we had air. This is an example of clean energy, of how our future world can look like. These are energy harvesting kites. An old idea by Wibbe Ockels, one of our famous Dutch astronauts who went to space as an astronaut, saw planet Earth, said, 
my God, we're doing it all wrong, came back and started to invent all these crazy things. He had the dream of making kites which would produce power. So it's a smart kite, high up in the sky, searching for the optimal wind, and connected with the ground via a cable. And on the ground, there's like this huge uh, dynamo, you know, like on your bicycle, producing light, producing electricity. He had the dream to realize that, but he died in 2013. Never got a chance to realize it. And I heard about that story. He told me that story. And one day I woke up and I realized I should make his dream come true. Yes, he died, but I'm still here. Why not? So we called his widow, the students. We started to spend some love, time, energy. And because the, the, the cable became so important, we started to make it light emitting. And 12 months, 14 months later, we realized it. Can you do sound up a bit? So each kite can produce 20 to 100 kilowatts per hour. That's enough for 200 households. And it's very, very interesting, you know, energy is everywhere. All we have to do is harvest it. This is uh, the widow of Wibbe Okkels, eh, of the famous astronaut, Joos Okkels. So she came to the opening, eh? she's like, you know, sort of holding on to him. Eh? And she was really excited, you know. So that's also interesting when you think about the future. You don't have to invent everything yourself. Sometimes it's already there, hidden in drawers with dust on it. And your job as an architect is to activate it and to make it happen and, and to make it real. And maybe this is how I like to see the future. Beautiful, functional, connecting different disciplines, you know, entrepreneur, technology, tourism. I think these kind of connecting of different sectors that's where the, what the future is about. And this was also interesting because I showed it to my Chinese clients uh, in Yunnan, South Province, last week. And they loved it because I forgot, but of course I remembered, kites are a Chinese invention. Long, long time ago. <laughs> so they have a sort of emotional connection with it. And we sort of upgraded it and made a new kite. So they, they liked it a lot. So we're going to uh, build many of them to make all the new hotels energy neutral. This is the Afsluitdijk, our famous 32 kilometer dam built by hand in 1932. So on the left you have the sea, and on the right you have the Netherlands, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, my own hometown. So as I said before, we live below sea level. Without design, without technology, we would literally die. Yes, we would drown a horrible death. So we fight with nature, we live with nature for more than a thousand years. And what is interesting is that this is our Eiffel Tower, eh? this is our, 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 our icon, this is you know, uh, our Monica, Monica Peace, this is holy. Um, what, what, what's holy in Russia? Sorry? Okay, fair enough, yeah. So that's this in the Netherlands, yeah. <laughs> so normally, you are not allowed to touch. It's a monument, don't touch. But because of Riley's rising sea level, it was in need of renovation to make it higher, to make it strong because sea level is rising. And so our minister of infrastructure came to me, a lady minister, and she said, it's so beautiful. It's a machine, but it's also culture. It's an icon. Can you make something to highlight this beautiful identity? We're very proud of it, but not so many people know. And so I was very honored by that. And we started to look 
and think what we should do. And what you see, of course, it's like a Zen line eh? in the water. It's beautiful, very naked. So rule one that we agreed on in the studio, we're not going to add more objects. Eh? Keep it simple, keep it naked, keep it pure. Built by hand in 1932, eh? rock by rock. So it's really like labor. And when we were there, we saw these floodgates, 60 of them at the beginning and in the end. So they open and close the walls of water. If these fail, we die. Very simple. Slowly, but we die. And they are designed by Dirk Roseburg in 1932, the great-great-grandfather of Rem Koolhaas, the first architect who was invited by the Dutch government to think in an aesthetic way about functional object. And as you can see, they look like temples, yes? Beautiful. But when we saw them four years ago, um, basically, they, they look like shit. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was like, they were really bad maintained. All the, the concrete was rotten. It looked like the, the inside of a smoker's lung, you know, like, ah, it's not so beautiful. So we're like, okay, we're gonna get some finance to renovate them, eh, to make them beautiful again. But also, we didn't want to do only history, we wanted to do future. We wanted to do something with light and with energy and poetry, but we realized that everything with LED, cables, microchip, sensors would break down eh, because of the salt and the rain, not very sustainable. And after two or three days thinking, we realized, okay, but of course there's already light present on this highway. Eh, there's already light available, which is the light of the cars, very good. So that took us two days, yeah. <laughs> the headlights of the cars. Oh, that's interesting. So inspired by the wing of a butterfly, yes, using reflection. The wing of a butterfly, my clothes, like the black, is toxic, eh? toxic pink pigment, ink. All your clothes have toxic pigment. Not so good, not the wing of a butterfly. On a microscopical level, it creates a texture that some light is absorbed, some light is mutated, and that's why the wing of a butterfly always remains vivid. That's really, if you ever are in search of meaning of life, feel a bit down, you look at the wing of a butterfly. <laughs> it's really amazing. So we're like, okay, maybe we can use reflection to make something which lasts for 100 years. So we dragged our minister of infrastructure into the story. This is the lady minister. It's very important with clients, eh? show them, prove it. And using the headlights of the car, three years later, 324 people, budget of 13 million euro, renovate them again. This is daytime, nighttime. And you can go there every night for free. No ticket needed with your electric car, hopefully. And it's day there for coming 100 years, purely based on the reflection of your headlights. You know, why do we have streetlights burning the whole night when nobody's there? That's really stupid. Eh? It consumes a lot of electricity, a lot of light pollution. And how can we take what is already there, eh? the, the headlights of the car, and sort of upcycle, upgrade it, push it to a new level? What is interesting is it sort of looks simple. It was quite complicated, but in the end, the result has its own poetry, eh? revealing the blueprint of the architect a replacement for headlights, and there's only light when the car is there. So there was no light pollution for the animals who were living around it. This is a very uh, nature-sensitive area. So this is an example of how I would like to see the future. Practical poetry combining 
to create a world which is good for us, but also for the animals and the people around. I really started to enjoy that kind of thinking, you know, combining these two worlds, uh, having this 80% bullshit you have to go through eh, to get the 20% beauty, the negation, the testing, the failing, the learning. And I started to really get a hang of, of, of bicycle paths and roads and infrastructure. For example, this, um, this is one of the first bicycle paths that we made, which charges at daytime via the sun and glows at night. No battery, no electricity. In the area where Van Gogh lived, eh, the famous Dutch painter, he walked these grounds in 1853, 55. And then he left to Paris, made the famous, uh, to France, made the famous Starry Night. And the Van Gogh Foundation came to us and asked, can you make something to celebrate his 125th anniversary? And instead of doing something in a museum with a sign, please do not touch, which I hate, we went to visit his location and do something new. So this is the bicycle path, and you can go there also every night. It's nearby Eindhoven. Um, public space. And it's really interesting to think how can you connect history eh, as Van Gogh walked these grounds with future, with green landscapes. And these kind of projects are also collaborations eh, between infrastructure company. Um, so the CEO of an infrastructure company contacted me to work together. That is like the most traditional risk avoiding business in the world. Eh? So a car manufacturer is sexy, glamorous, billions of research and development, eh? BMW, Tesla, very normal. Road world is not. <laughs> Should be cheap, maintenance free, nobody cares. But the CEO of that company realized he had to invest in ideas, in new ideas to survive. And so these projects are innovation, not just material and not, not just poetry but combining different sectors, the infrastructure world with the art world, a world which normally doesn't really communicate, um, but you need those two, you need those two connections in order to make these projects happen. And we started to do highways as well, charging at daytime, glowing at night up to eight hours. We were playing a lot of Daft Punk when we were designing this. Yeah. Philip Glass and Daft Punk, yeah. And last one, what are we looking at? Oh, I'm curious if you know this one. What are we looking at? Hmm? I hear it there. Space junk. Oh, you know. Yeah, very good. This is not an undiscovered Jackson Pollock or an Autumn. This is space waste, space junk. 8.1 million kilo of space junk, which is currently floating around the Earth. And it started in 1957. Sputnik, Apollo, pieces of satellites and missiles started to collide and create this layer of junk around our precious planet Earth. So somehow we are not satisfied polluting our planet Earth. We just keep on going outside the Earth atmosphere. Crazy. And I saw this image on one of the, the desktop computers of my designers. And I walked by, I'm like, what's, what's that? He said, that's space waste. I'm like, that's sick. You know, that's crazy, but it's also sort of beautiful, you know, it's sort of an obscene beauty. And so I became fascinated with that. I think every project you do, when you talk about future, 
you have to be this sort of voluntary prisoner of your own idea. Yeah? <laughs> you have to sort of surrender to the idea. You have to know everything about it, wanting to know everything about it. And so we launched Space Waste Lab with ASA, the European uh, uh, Space Agency. Phase one, visualize it. Phase two, fix it. Phase three, upcycle it, do something new. We started to map all the space junk, which is currently above our head. This is more or less real time of five minutes ago. So they all have numbers. Eh? So Delta is American. You have a lot of Russian, by the way. So this is, let me find a Russian one. Oh yeah, Cosmos, 2251 DAB. That's your, that's you, yeah. <laughs> and this just shows the craziness. Eh? How can we do with it? Because if a tiny piece, because of its high speed, 27,000 kilometers per hour, it hits an existing satellite, it's like a bomb, you know, buff. So it's a threat for our today communication. Eh? If it destroys new satellites, it's a threat for our day-to-day -day style, eh? our internet. No more Facebook, no more banking, no more Strelka website, no more Instagram. <gasps> you know? And nobody really knows how to fix it. And what was interesting is when we were talking with the space expert is that A, nobody really had a solution yet, proven, but also nobody really cared. Maybe most of you don't even know about this topic. So, okay, two years later, everybody sort of agrees in the industry that a net is the most realistic idea to capture it. So you have a small satellite, you launch it together with a big satellite, it has 10, 20 nets, and you sort of, pack, you grab it. Okay, okay, okay. So that sort of, you know, could work. But as we were working on that mission, we realized, of course, nobody wants to clean up. Nobody wants to pay. Cleaning up is not fun. It's the same like when you were a boy or a girl and your mother tells you, clean up your room. It's like, yeah, yeah, mom, yeah, whatever. I will have eh, my popcorn, my ice cream, I will watch television, but I'm not going to clean up the room, or at least I didn't. So we realized we had to in, um, uh, integrate and sort of introduce the power of design, the power of creativity, because traditional way of thinking was stuck. 10, 15 years, they were stuck. Okay, so what we did then is A, realize that I am not smarter than these space experts, because they're like, really, really smart. But what I can do is look at a different way, add a new perspective. And so we said, okay, if you capture it, maybe it's not a problem, but maybe it's an ingredient. Maybe you can build with it. So one of the proposals we're working on now is to capture it and 3D print moon habitats with it. So NASA will 3D print on the moon. That's already set, it's in their agenda, the coming years but they're going to ship all this expensive material from the Earth all the way up. That's really stupid. Huh? Just capture what is there and upcycle it, do something new. Or here, can we sort of collect it and create a solar reflector huh, to reduce global warming uh, over the ice? Or here, can we capture it like with a sort of garbage truck, a garbage rover, huh, that it sort of burns up creating plasma fuel to, to recharge, uh, refuel satellites which run out of battery. Some ideas were very welcomed by the industry. Other ideas, not so much. <laughs> so when you do future, it's very important to realize um, the term Maya. That's a, a term from an American professor in 1960, most advanced yet acceptable. Yes? Most advanced yet acceptable. So it's very simple. If you go too far, if you go too far in your process, it's crazy. People say you're crazy, it doesn't work, you go over budget, your girlfriend dumps you because you're never home. Not good. Eh? You don't want to go there. But if you stay too safe, it's boring or nobody cares. So you have to try to find the balance. Yes? So with 3D printing Moon, everybody said, yeah, 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 we could do that. And with this, they sort of politely shook their head. This one, yeah, maybe, maybe not. But the most realistic one that we're pushing now, and it actually has a chance of survival in this brutal yes-but world, 
is this. So when you capture the space junk with the net, eh, and in a controlled re-entry, it goes back to the Earth. It hits the Earth atmosphere. What happens then? It burns, yes. That's really interesting. Waste is light. What if we would use that principle to create shooting stars, eh? artificial fireworks? And it appears, yes, we can. <laughs> so this is what we're working on now. We're going to China City, Dubai City, and saying, you are spending millions of euros on fireworks, eh? traditional fireworks. It's very polluting for the earth, eh? for the air. It's a bit boring. You've seen it all. Let's just take that budget, take that money, and invest it in this. Eh? You clean up space, and you get a new sense of firework. This is an example of how you can take something and upgrade it and upcycle it. And we're pushing right now to make this happen in the coming three to five years. So you may look at all these projects, eh? and, and okay, you're, you're cool, but there is a world out there which is a bit more cynical and says, dear Mr. Rosegarde, that's all very great, but it sounds like a utopia. Eh? This perfect world, this rainbow on the horizon, which we will never, ever reach. And I don't agree with that. I think this is a new reality, but I don't believe in utopia. I believe in protopia, prototype, step by step, trying to improve. We try, we learn, we fail, we try again and make it happen, yes? So I think this is also your role as an architect, to realize that a lot of challenges we are facing, rising sea level, air pollution, noise pollution, sound pollution, um, are bad design. And you, as an architect, as a designer, can actually use it as an ingredient to experiment, to explore, to express. But you gotta be smart, and you gotta be part of the protopia. Don't be scared, but improving. What I also realized to conclude, and then we, I want, where's my ring, by the way? Yeah. Uh, where's there? Okay, good, there's a little GPS in it, so I will find you. Yeah. I also realized that, okay, we talked about clean air, clean water, clean energy, clean space, but in the end, it's about the mind. Huh? The mind, the thinking, the creativity, the layer which is above that. And so four months ago, we launched our project Presence, our first indoor solo exhibition. While we usually stay outdoor, we did something indoor, where your physical presence, your physical being, creates the artwork. Without you, it does not exist. To sort of show how important it is to realize that you are connected. You're a part of the problem, but you're also part of the solution. And we broke a rule. Yeah? Everything is please touch. Normally, you're not allowed to touch, so we made something please touch. And this is on show uh, until January. Presence is a dream landscape which interacts with your behavior. I wanted to create a place where you feel connected. It shows the impact you have on the world around you, in which you make the artwork, and the artwork makes you. Thank you.